Okay, do you see my screen? Yes, we can yeah, see. Everything's so okay. I'm sorry, I just had some technical problems. So uh, good evening, and I would like to thank uh, Catherine and Hagit for inviting me uh, to give this presentation. And um, I'm actually also going to talk about the meeting of people. Uh, water is also concerned, but this time we'll be talking about the Mediterranean. Uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. So um, the Crusader conquest of the Mediterranean Eastern shores led to almost 200 years of Latin rule over an indigenous population of Oriental Christians, Muslims and Jews in the newly established Latin states, the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the, county of, uh, the counties of Tripoli and Edessa, the Principality of Antioch, and the Kingdom of Cyprus. Um, um, following the First Crusade, people of varied social status from the Western Mediterranean migrated to and settled in these states. Over time, this eventually imitated other types of movement, such as transmission of new ideas and technologies and maritime and overland trade. The ruling Franks consisted a demographical minority, while the indigenous population were a subjected political minority, but at the same time, a demographic majority. The, the cross-cultural encounters be between these different populations have attracted scholarly attention in the framework of the study of the Crusades and the uh, Latin Levant. The, a colonialist segregation view as expressed by R.C. Smale and uh, Joshua Praver, which claimed geographical, social, and culture isolation of the Latin newcomers from the indigenous population in the 1950s, was later re-evaluated. Scholars such as Jonathan Riley Smith and Ronnie Ellenblum have addressed topics of the system of land use, the rural population, and Frankish settlement revealing intensive Frankish rural settlement, the adoption of local administrative patterns, and involvement in agriculture. Today, Crusader period scholars are in increasingly investigating influences and cultural borrowing in artistic, architectural, religious, military, governmental, administrative, and intellectual activities that resulted from almost two centuries of coexistence of the Latins and the local population in the Levant. This paper will provide a new perspective of the consequences of the Frankish migration to the Eastern Mediterranean through ceramic production. We will examine the archeological material finds that clearly attest that the potters sized the new opportunities and transformed some existing pottery workshops along with emerging new wor workshops into a thriving industry targeted for maritime export. It will show how ceramics became part of the lucrative maritime trade as indicated by their wide circulation and by meager textual evidence. It will also attempt to further understand the dynamics of this development by comparing it with another thriving newly established Frankish industry, crystallized sugar produced from sugar cane. So pottery is the most abundant artifact type found in archeological excavations due to their high breakage rate and resistance to decay. The material required for pottery manufactured are easily available and cheap, and therefore pottery was commonly used by people of all levels of society. Ceramics are tangible evidence of everyday life and a straightforward documentation of their life cycles. As a result, this mutant archaeological find is a valuable tool for research of the past. And maybe I should add here that um, 
most of my research is um, connected to uh, the ceramic wares in the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. And, um, and this is uh, the reason that I am uh, presenting uh, this. So just for those of you who are not very familiar with uh, ceramics, um, ceramic assemblages comprise various forms of vessels. The majority utilized for fruit preparation, storage, and dining. The basic forms are cooking pots, um, jars, jugs, and bowls, just to name a few. And these could have been make it, have been um, manufactured from different fabrics. And here at the bottom, you can see um, photos of the different fabrics. And you can see that the colors are different, they're additives, grits, and inclusions. And um, the, these fabrics are actually according to the available geological materials within the production region, as well as the local ceramic tradition. So different decoration techniques, slip painted, glaze painted, and scraffito could be applied to some of the vessels, as well as glaze or paint while others, like those at the bottom, were left bare. When ceramic vessels share distinctive features, including fabric, forms, and decoration, meaning that they were made of a single ceramic tradition, they may be considered as a single ware, as the acre ware that you can see at the bottom of the slide that was produced uh, in acre. Um, a ware may have uh, been produced in a single pottery workshop or in a cluster of workshops in the same geographical region. Pottery assemblages, which are a composition of different ceramic used by a group of people, contain both local and imported ware. Um, ceramic assemblages were not homogeneous and they seem to vary not only between geographical regions, but also between cultural ethnic environments in the same region. The variation is for the most due to the different local wares produced and used in each region, but assemblages can also vary in the presence or absence of imports and in the relative quantities of the different imports. For example, you can see here the results of a study I conducted a few years ago, what, where I compared uh, ceramic assemblages from three different sites. Um, Horvat Utsa, which is a Frankish village, Horvat Bedzenita, a local village, and uh, the Frankish city and port of uh, Acre. And you can see that uh, if you take a look at the different types of wares, you can see that you can find the same types of wares in all of these places. Here, uh, for example, we see Cypriot pottery, but when you quantify the pottery, and this is what you can see on the chart, um, there are different quantities in uh, each site, and uh, this can really give us a hint about the consumption patterns of uh, different populations. So um, during the decades, the study of Crusader period pottery attracted increasing attention. It is fairly a new field. Um, excavated and surveyed ceramic assemblages dating to the Frankish presence in the Latin East and Cyprus were published from a growing number of sites. In some regions such as Acre and the southeastern Levant, ceramics have been comprehensively studied, while at others, uh, further research is required. Ceramic assemblages from Acre, the 13th century capital of the Kingdom of Jerusalem and a major port and other sites were studied in collaboration with Anastasia Shapiro and Yona Waxman um, and uh, Anastasia analyzed uh, the pottery by petrography and uh, Yona by chemical analysis. And in, the, in these analysis, um, they studied the raw materials of which the ceramics were manufactured in order to detect their provenience. 
So um, Yona Waxman also initiated the Pomodoro project, People, Pottery and Food in the Medieval Eastern Mediterranean, in which analytical comparative research was performed to pottery excavated in various sites in Israel to study the impact of the Crusades on ceramic production and use. This lecture is standing on the shoulders of both this project and a research performed by another research group, Food and Food Habits in Crusader Context, combining archeological and textual evidence in which uh, Judy Bronstein and Lisa Yehuda, who is uh, here tonight also, um, we uh, researched the development of sugar production from a small scale local production into an industry with significant technological developments that became a profitable export good due to the involvement of the Frankish newcomers and of course, other topics uh, regarding food. So um, going back to the ceramics, uh, we have identified or we know of three regional workshop clusters manufacturing each a, a similar repertoire of wares. And these will be used here to study the development of pottery production under the Franks. So these include the region of the Principality of Antioch and the Kingdom of Armenia, Cilicia, Paphos Lemba in the Kingdom of Cyprus. Both centers were manufacturing standardized mass-produced glazed bowls. Um, and Beirut in the Kingdom of Jerusalem that was manufacturing mostly cooking ware, but also uh, some glazed ware and other kitchen ware. On this table, you can see a short comparison, comparison of the three main exporting uh, clusters. And um, you know, just uh, to quickly compare between them. Um, so in Beirut and in the Principality of Antioch, uh, it was possible to detect a continuation of earlier production, while in Cyprus, there was no uh, previous production. In Beirut, a production was going on during the 12th and 13th century. In the area of the Principality of Antioch, um, there is some development, but the type of ware known as ports and simian ware was manufactured only in the 13th century, in Paphos also only in the 13th century. Um, okay, Beirut was producing cooking ware, glazed table and kitchen ware while the Principality of Antioch and Paphos only glazed tableware. And there was use of um, tripod stilts in the princi Principality of Antioch, both tripod stilts and kiln bars, while in Beirut only kiln bars and in Paphos only tripod stilts. Now, just to explain, tripod stilts are a device placed between glazed bowls in the kiln, in the kiln to prevent them from sticking to each other when the glaze liquidized during fire, firing. They were in use in the Islamic world during the 10th and 11th century. The kiln bars are devices uh, placed between glazed bowls in the kiln to prevent them from sticking to each other. When, again, when the glaze liquefies during a uh, firing, I'm sorry. <laughs> The kiln bars allowed it stacking larger quantities in the kiln and served as spacers. They were inserted in the walls to produce shelves on which the vessels were placed. Like tripod stilts, the kiln bars were also in use in the Islamic world during the 10th and the 11th century. And uh, they were found in various excavations in the Levant. Okay, now we will uh, take a look at the organization of production centers. And it is not a coincidence that most of the export ceramic workshops were organized in clusters and situated on the seacoast or in its proximi proximity. A cluster uh, in order to enlarge the output and um, the location to facilitate distribution by sea. 
So I just want to say that in the Paphos Lemba region, um, there is uh, remains of almost uh, eight different workshops. And in the area of Antioch and the kingdom of Armenia, Cilicia, uh, again, something like six uh, workshops that were uh, identified. And apparently in Beirut, in the city itself, there were a few workshops. Regarding continuity and change, so most of the ceramics in use during the Fatimid period were consumed uninterruptly regarding the Frankish annexation. As mentioned, uninterrupted production occurred at Beirut and Antioch, Cilicia. And uh, textual sources indicate that the previous inhabitants continued to reside at Beirut after the Frankish conquest in 1110. So it is not surprising that the shape and glaze of the cooking and tablewares did not change considerably during the transition in regime. The Antiochian and Cilician ceramic workshops witness, witnessed in the 13th century an increase in their production volume, perhaps also in the number of workshops and the introduction of new motifs and themes on the balls, on the balls, some of them to cater the Frankish taste. As you can see here, um, a knight holding a sword and apparently a shield in a Western uh, depiction and Western uh, shields. In contrast, in Cyprus, only after the Frankish annexation, new workshops producing glazed tablewares emerged at the Paphos Lemba region. Their, product, their products were widely distributed to the Latin East, and this is indicated by archeological finds and the excavated sites in which um, Cypriot finds uh, were unearthed can be seen on this map. And actually, I think it is safe to say that there are more examples of Cypriot uh, pottery in the Latin East um, than in um, Cyprus. So uh, now we'll uh, take a look at the cultural identity of the potters. And as mentioned above, local population continued to reside at Beirut after the Frankish takeover. takeover. Hence, it would be say, safe to say that some of the local potters or pottery families uh, whether they were Muslims or Oriental Christians, continued to operate the ceramic workshops. The same is apparently true for some of the workshops in the territories of Antioch and Cilicia, where some of the potters may have been also Armenian. Shortly after the Frankish annexation, glazed bowls were manufactured for the first time in Cyprus at Paphos Lemba. The wide use of tripod stilts to separate the glazed, glazed vessels and the immediately skills and technological knowledge of how to produce highly qual a high quality glazed vessels as been shown by analysis by Carmen Ting and others demonstrates that it did not come out of nowhere. It has been suggested that the glazed technology followed pre-existing Eastern Mediterranean tradition, traditions, meaning that either local potters adopted import, imported glazed traditions and the use of tripod stilts, or most likely, as I will suggest uh, below, the technology was transformed by tra was transferred by foreign potters from the neighboring regions, perhaps the Latin East. Uh, so this was specialized production for export. And uh, as I said, the Crusader period wit witnessed an increase in the number of coastal workshops focusing on a specific ware, coinciding with improved glaze technology and the use of tripod stilts and kiln bars. All this indeed facilitated mass production for export. The glazed bowls and plates 
uh, were specifically designed for Western dining. Um, and those were produced in the workshops of the Paphos Lemba and Antioch Cilicia workshops were densely packed and shipped by foreign and local maritime merchants. They were part of a broader phenomena in which other 13th century mass produced glazed Mediterranean bowls flooded the markets of the Latin East, including Zexipus wares that you can see at the bottom, uh, Proto Maiolica that you can see in the circle, and more. The wide distribution of uh, Beirut glazed cooking ware is evidence that they too were extensively transported by sea. Despite being bulky, the suitable available raw materials and the high quality of the vessels seem to be the reason for Beirut becoming the main producer of cooking ware, at least for the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. Rare commercial contracts of the ports of Acre, Beirut, and Magrat that each have some sort of archeological evidence for pottery production, as you can see here, uh, survived. Uh, we don't have time to uh, read uh, all of these sources, but um, all of them mention duties imposed on export and import of ceramics, demonstrating that they were profit profitable for both local authority and for the merchants. For instance, there is a contract between Jean de Iblin, the Lord of Beirut, and the Genoese merchants in 1223, and it indicates the involvement of the latter in the export of ceramics from Beirut in significant volume. Scott Redford has previously suggested that increased productions at the Antioch Cilician workshops during the 13th century was not only to cater the growing need, uh, the, the needs of a growing ceramic market, but perhaps deliberate promotion of manufacture by the Italian merchants, especially the Genoese, aimed for maritime distribution as they were very active in the Northeastern Mediterranean economic growth. It appears that the connection between ceramic manufacture and maritime traders started already in the 12th century with the Beirut cooking ware. And finally, we will make a short comparison between the Frankish sugar and ceramic production. So contemporaneously and in a similar matter, manner to pottery production transformation in the Crusader states, sugarcane production also advanced. After acquainting themselves with the new land and its products, the Franks began exploiting and influencing sugar manufacture. They acquired the knowledge and the skills required for sugar cane cultivation, introduced significant technological developments that raised production volume. This consequently enabled sugar to emerge as one of the kingdom's most lucrative export goods. Textual evidence points to the involvement of local inhabitants in this industry as the workmen and as foremen. Local Oriental Christians, experts in sugar production, transferred their knowledge from the Latin states to Lusignan Cyprus and to Palermo in Sicily by, by Emperor Friedrich II in the early 13th century. Written sources also indicates that Frankish uh, landlords, kings, nobilities, and the military orders benefited both from the plantations and from the taxes levied on production and export through the ports. Texts from the 13th century onwards also indicate that maritime uh, merchants mainly the Venetians and the Genoese, benefited from their increased involvement in the export of sugar. Consequently, to further exploit economic profits, they acquired sugar plantations and production sites entire on the Lebanese coast. 
As more textual sources from the mid 12th century onward survive on sugar manufacture, and despite a few dis dissimilarities, comparing these two industries allows additional insights into the ceramic industry and contributes towards understanding the dynamics that caused the growth of pottery production in the Crusader lamb. So these are the main ports and keep in mind what we talked about in the ceramic production when we're talking now about the sugar production. So uh, once the Franks were, so as with sugar production, once the Franks were exposed to local ceramic practices, their input became evident. Production evolved from a small scale to in some cases, a large industrial magnitude. Sugarcane and its production process was not known to the Frankish newcomers. Not only did they rely on the locals and their expertise at first, but they were most of the workers in the Frankish industry. Moreover, in the 13th century, local experts brought their knowledge to Cyprus and Sicily. Although pottery production was not new to the Franks, it was more developed in the East. The local potters previously involved in manufacture at Beirut and at the territories of Antioch and Cilicia further developed their craft and perhaps like in the sugar industry also shared and spread their knowledge in Cyprus and at other locations. Technological improvements in sugar production were attested in both the textual and archeological sources. The tripod stilts and kiln bars found in many archeological excavations are the evidence to technological advances in ceramic production that enabled the increase of production volume. The link between the landlords and the Italian maritime merchants and the establishment of new sugar production centers is clear. In a similar manner to being entrepreneurs en en in the sugar industry, they may have also initiated large scale ceramic production for export in their don domains and ports of call to benefit from the profits for export and import of ceramic wares. These could be either newly established centers like in Cyprus or enhancement of existing centers um, at major ports with extensive Genoese and Venetian commercial activities like in the Principality of Antioch or at Beirut or even at Acre. So to sum up the development of pottery production under the Franks apparently brought to a change in the economic significance of ceramics as it became not only an everyday production, um, an everyday consumption product, but also a lucrative good produced on an industrial scale targeted for maritime export. While most of the potters in the workshops may have been locals, the connection to the Frankish and in interpreters and maritime merchant was the winning card for pottery production in the Latin East. This clearly demonstrates the impact of migration and cross-cultural interactions towards prosperity and economic growth in the Eastern Mediterranean during the 12th and mainly in the 13th century. Thank you very much. <laughs>